Who is our, uh, yeah, our, our one of the dangerous dozen for this morning. Um, he is considered a saint in the Anglican Communion. Um, and so this is, the, this is the collect for his feast day. The Lord be with you. Let us pray. O God, whose Son, the Good Shepherd, laid down his life for the sheep, we give you thanks for your faithful shepherd, Janani Lewum, who, after his Savior's example, gave up his life for the people of Uganda. Grant us to be so inspired by his witness that we make no peace with oppression, but live as those who are sealed with the cross of Christ, who died and rose again and now lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, forever and ever. Amen. So, Janani Lewum was born in Uganda, close to the border of Sudan, in 1922. And he was a member of the Akoli tribe. Forgive me, I, I'm probably mispronouncing that, but that's as, uh, that's as much as I know. He started his career as a teacher. He mastered the liberal arts and graduated from the Bora Boro Teacher Training College. In 1948, then, he was, quote-unquote, converted by the... Balokole movement, which is a charismatic revival movement which began in the 30s and swept throughout East Africa, especially Uganda, Kenya, Tanzania, Rwanda, and Burundi. So this revival movement was aimed at reviving lukewarm Christians who belonged to the institutional churches, mainly by emphasizing the work of the Holy Spirit in each person's individual life and a personal appropriation of Christ's work through repentance, confession of sins, and conversion. Now, as one might expect, this sort of charismatic movement was looked upon with a great deal of suspicion by those who were within the institutional churches, and the institutional churches were likewise looked at with a great deal of suspicion by the revivalists. But this is really how um, Archbishop Lewum's faith got its, um, its characteristic flavor. Lawoom, who'd been raised a Christian since his birth, was now one by choice as a willing convert. This happened in uh, January 1948, and he said this about it. He said, when I was converted, after realizing that my sins were forgiven and the implications of Christ's death and resurrection, I was overwhelmed by a sense of joy and peace. I suddenly found myself climbing a tree to tell those in the school compound to repent and turn to Christ. The reality of Jesus overwhelmed me, and it still does. It's magnificent. So the leaders of this charismatic movement saw in Lewum an opportunity to credential, so to speak, so that the movement could become a little bit more trustworthy in the eyes of the institutional church. Lewum was incredibly smart. He'd already successfully become a teacher. They saw in him a great deal of promise. Uh, perhaps he could become educated and kind of give some intellectual credence to the movement. So they asked Lewum to pursue ordination in the Church of Uganda, which is an Anglican church. So he became a priest and then a deacon. He was ordained a priest in 1956 and he was sent to study at St. Augustine's College in Canterbury in England, a place that was really um, known as being a kind of incubator for future leaders of the Anglican Communion. After he studied in England, he returned to Uganda, and rather shockingly, both to him and to all these folks who had put so much trust in him, he wasn't an immediate pastoral success. Um, he was disappointed basically that his parish didn't grow as um, he and everyone else had kind of expected it to. Over time, he was, uh, he, he was placed at Buolasi Theological College, and there, actually, at the college, his ministry blossomed. Then he became a provincial secretary of the Church of Uganda, which is a rather highfalutin position in the church hierarchy, and was later made a consultant to the Lambeth Conference of all bishops in the Anglican Communion in a 1968 meeting. In 1969 then, he was made the bishop of the Diocese of Northern Uganda. As bishop, he really, uh, his style was to, um, to use massive preaching crusades in order to convert immense amounts of people and to revive their spirits, not unlike the charismatic movement that he had experienced um, when he was younger. 
They reflected, indeed, the fervor and the theology of that charismatic movement in which he was kind of, uh, in which he came of age as a Christian, so to speak. Now, Uganda had become a nation independent from the British Empire in 1962. The first prime minister was Milton Obote, with King Edward Mutisa I holding a kind of ceremonial role as the president. With the cooperation, though, of Idi Amin, who is pictured on the right here, who is a rising military leader, Obote took control of the Ugandan government, rewrote the constitution, and ejected King Mutisa. But only five years later, Abode himself was toppled by Idi Amin in a military coup, the two of them having had a falling out and Abote um, preparing to arrest Amin for misappropriation of funds. It's like Idi Amin just kind of got to him first. Amin repeatedly promised that he was only preparing the country for democratic elections but over time consolidated his power, as many of you know far better than I do. Initially, Amin was looked on by many in the West as a better option than Abote, as often happens in uh, Western foreign policy, because they had worried about uh, Abote shifting a little bit too much to the left at the time, and he was perhaps going to ally himself with the Soviet Union. So initially, Amin was kind of looked on as a, as a kind of good thing from a Western perspective, but then uh, he began purging Uganda of entire ethnic groups disappearing critics of the government, and he infamously expelled all Asians from Uganda in August 1972. He said that this was in the name of what he called an economic war aimed at commandeering the property of uh, Ugandans of Asian descent and their businesses for the rest of the Ugandan people whom he claimed had been stolen from. He cut ties with Britain made an alliance with Muammar Gaddafi of Libya and with the USSR. And by 73, the US had closed its embassy and severed all diplomatic ties to Uganda. That happened in 73. In 74, Janani Lewum was elected the Archbishop of the Church of Uganda. So that's the political situation surrounding him. Now, Lewum was in a very precarious position as he himself understood. He was initially reached out to by Amin for counsel and advice, and um, Lewum met with Amin, and um, when he was criticized for doing that, he said, quote, he is also a child of God. He was often criticized, actually, for cozying up to the government a bit too much. There was a great deal of economic decline, though, as the story I just told suggested in part due to the deportation of Asian Ugandans and the collapse of the sector of the economy in which their businesses really predominated. As violence in continued to increase, Lewum invited the Roman Catholic Cardinal, the Orthodox Bishop, and the Sheikh Mufti of Uganda, who's the chief Muslim leader at that time in Uganda, at the Church of Uganda's conference center to put together a platform for working together across faiths to achieve peace and the common good and to reform the government. This was really, well, it was be the beginning of the end for Lewum, because Amin saw Lewum as an agitator and an enemy at this point, after he had convoked this meeting, notwithstanding his uh, relative cooperation with the government from time to time. In 1976, then, as relations began to deteriorate, Lewum preached a radio sermon critical of the government. The broadcast was taken off the air, and Lewum's house was raided by the Ugandan military two months later. He and many bishops, after this raid, wrote a letter of protest against the government. Here's an, an excerpt from this letter itself, which describes the raid. We are deeply disturbed to learn of the incident which occurred at the Archbishop's official residence in the early hours of Saturday morning, the 5th of February. In the history of our country, such an incident in the church has never before occurred. Security forces broke through the fence and forced their way into the archbishop's compound. They used a man they had arrested and tortured as a decoy to entice the archbishop to open his door to help a man seemingly in distress. Using a man under duress and torture as a source of information can lead to unnecessary suffering of innocent individuals. The archbishop opened the door. At that point, armed men who had been hiding sprung up to attack, cocking their rifles, demanding arms. When the archbishop asked, what arms? The answer 
was the muzzle of a gun pressed against his stomach, and immediately he was pushed forcefully into his house with the demand, Archbishop, show us the arms, run into the bedroom. The full story, as told by the Archbishop, is appended to this letter. First, we want to register our shock and protest at this kind of treatment to the leader of the Church of Uganda, Rwandi, Burundi, and Bogo Zaire. Then we shall draw out the implications of this incident to the rest of the bishops and all the Christians of the Church of Uganda. This is why we are very disturbed and with us the whole Church of Uganda. We feel that if it was necessary to search the Archbishop's house, he should have been approached in broad daylight by responsible senior officers, fully identified in conformity with his position in society. But to search him in his house at gunpoint deep in the night leaves us without words. We might add only to say the least. A few days later, Lewum and his wife Mary were interrogated in the presidential palace. They managed to be released, but two days after that, they were brought to a rally in Kampala of Amin supporters, and Lewum was accused in the midst of this assembly of an arms smuggling deal, basically trying to stage a coup against Amin. In light of these trumped up charges, he was arrested, and he was separated from his fellow bishops. As he was being led away from his fellow bishops, he said, quote, I see God's hand in this. We don't know what happened after that, actually. He was taken away in a car with two other prisoners. The government says that there was a, or the government said, excuse me, that there was a, an escape attempt and that the car crashed during the escape attempt. But some reports claim that Lewum's body was riddled with bullet wounds when it was seen later. The body was buried secretly, in any case, and the government refused all requests for a public memorial service. Thousands gathered at the cathedral, however, to honor Lewum alongside the first martyrs of Uganda who had died in the 1880s. Archbishop Lewum really maintained a legacy of, or he established a legacy of nonviolent resistance in the school of Martin Luther King Jr., whom he had read. And he wed this nonviolence to the charismatic theology which had been infused in him in the revival movement. It's worth noting that in addition to this profound legacy that he left theologically and politically, that Archbishop of York, John Sintamu, himself an exile from Uganda to England, was mentored by Lewum. Dr. Sintamu is still, he's currently the Archbishop of York. When Lewum was killed, Archbishop Sintamu says he made the following vow. Quote, you kill my friend, I take his place, end quote. That is quite the legacy, both in the Church of Uganda and the wider Anglican Communion, which as I mentioned at the beginning, celebrates Lewum as a saint, and his feast is on the 17th of February. So here, uh, these are, this is a set of statues called the Martyrs of the 20th Century, which can be found outside Westminster Abbey. We've shown you various pictures of folks throughout this series from, um, from this particular, uh, yeah, from this particular set. Lewum is the one who's farthest on the left, followed by Elizabeth of Hungary, Martin Luther King Jr., Oscar Romero and Dietrich Bonhoeffer. Proud company indeed. So, Dunani Lewum faced criticism from both sides for his approach to church-state relations. In our more democratic context, what does it mean to stand for Christ and for God's children in need? The second question, regarding Idi Amin, Lewum said that even the president needs friends. What does it mean to show friendship to leaders when they are acting clearly in the wrong? The third question is, it is not difficult to see how Lewum was influenced by figures such as Gandhi and Martin Luther King Jr., who are persons you have not met, but whose life and teachings have influenced you. I think that maybe uh, this side of the room can be one group and that side of the room can be another. Why don't this side of the group, you guys, uh, focus on the first question and the second side of the room, you can focus on the second question and the third question. Um, yeah, you can divide up your time as you see fit, whichever one seems most generative to you. Sound good? Okay, we'll reconvene very soon.
You can also feel free to switch groups if you want to answer a different question than the one you've been given.
connecting to this idea of their the yeah, everything's good. And they said it was like um, they wouldn't accept this, you know, that it was like a band or something. Like that. And in a so called democratic state. So I don't know. It's as if people, there's some force that wants to know the darkness and the depression. So we've got to tell that people are on the way and they've said people are still good at heart. You know, and give examples of the age we live in.
many situations where somebody is autocratic trying to solve it, which we don't agree at all. So there are two ways. Either you mobilize the weapon, then you have the risk that being killed and not getting anywhere, or we will try to talk to them and try to see convince them to, to change, because in every person there is some good, you know, even though majority may be bad, so there's always a chance that you at least you make the camp of him and uh, so they say, if you look at the bottom line, maybe the second one works better than the first one. So but that's a that, that yeah. uh, very difficult decision to have to make. Yeah. Um, I, I wonder if, um, as a way to close off, I wonder if Martin, 
would you be willing to share the story about um, his um, his uh, casket and the funeral? Um, to yeah, wrap this up. I don't know a better way to end uh, than just giving you the mic. Okay. Oh. Can I come, come back to you? I'm sorry. I'm just, I'm just going to Justin afterwards, and I said I, I studied the martyrs of Africa, you know, the Nau Nau's um, were in Kenya or Kenya or wherever you want to say it. And then there was Uganda. And any of my men did start off well because I had people from the church who had been there and he was driving around and he was a hero at first. But he had syphilis and he also later on that madness. Because anyone saw the movie The Last King of Scotland, it's very, very well done then. But what happened with um, the Archbishop, I, I can't say his name, but I'm going to probably all that he, when he was martyred, we heard Justin tell this, I brought people and the Christians together and took a stand. He, you know, he tried to bring on me him or change him. But when he was martyred, he was, we read about how he was taken away and, you know, they said he was involved in speaking arms, etc. But he, um, when he, there was a funeral at, at, in the village, and, the, uh, and just even before the funeral, when they heard the archbishop was dead, some little old lady, and she wasn't an intellectual or some student, she was just an ordinary person coming to church, and she saw the people most depressed, you know, look at the church, you know, this man has disappeared, he's obviously dead. <clears throat> and she said, but that's the way the church goes on. And it was like, all of a sudden, they realized what their faith was about, you know, the martyrs and what it meant. And he was buried there. But later on, they went, they, his coffin was there, or I don't know if you say caskets, or his coffin was But later on, people went and they opened it up, and he was missing. And the story got around, there was nobody in that coffin. And so it was like this, the grave was empty, you know, that, Thank you so much. That's it. It's as good an ending as any. How about you? See you in church.